Hello, everyone. Welcome to Avaya's Overcoming PTSD Curriculum. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are teachers, mentors, and the co-owners of Avaya University. Avaya is the creator of over a thousand books, films, courses, teachings, and other supportive resources. Thank you so much for joining us. Our fellow teacher, Simon Borg Olivier, is here to talk with us today about posture, movement, breathing, and mental control to overcome PTSD. Simon is co-director of Yoga Synergy, one of Australia's oldest and most respected yoga schools with a style based on deep understanding of yoga anatomy, yoga physiology, and traditional Hatha yoga. He is a registered physiotherapist, a research scientist, and a university lecturer. Simon has been regularly teaching internationally since 1982, and he has been regularly invited to teach at special workshops and conferences interstate and overseas since 1990. Thank you so much for being here with us, Simon. It is my pleasure to be here, Andy. Thank you very much for inviting me, and it's lovely to participate in this. Absolutely. So I'd love it if you'd share a little bit about just how did you get into the work that you do today? You do, you do so many things. You, when you sent me your bio, it was like so long with accomplishments and all sorts of stuff. So, so how did you get into what you do? Oh, look, my father was a free diver. So when I was six years old, he started teaching me very fancy forms of breath retention. So I could hold my breath, you know, for a long period of time when I was younger. And he taught me techniques, which many years later, I found out were yoga techniques. And so I started doing, you know, teaching yoga around the same time I was doing research in molecular biology and human biology. And that was, you know, 40 years ago. So since then, I've you know, done a lot of different teaching and became a physiotherapist. And as I've started to you know, teach more therapy clients, I realized that a lot of the um, people I was seeing were having not just physical or physiological problems, but a lot of mental issues, which possibly were integrated very deeply with their physical and physiological problems. And so I've become a lot more involved in trying to work with people on what I'll think is holistic level, physical, physiological, mental. And I use posture, movement, breathing, mental control, sometimes diet to address these things, you know, on all levels, physical, physiological, and the mental issues. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing a little bit about how you got to do what you do today. So let's break it down. You know, the topic today, you're talking about posture, movement, all sorts of different things. So, so let's start with posture. What, um, what's the importance of posture in our life and specifically related to people who have had trauma, um, are struggling with perhaps PTSD? How could that be helpful for them to know about? Well, it's people's daily posture becomes a very unconscious thing. And often, I think the stats are that most people are 95% of the time unconscious in their body. And so we start to fall into patterns that are not that useful for us. And so when I talk about developing posture, I give them postures that will retrain muscles, muscle memory, the, the neuromuscular junctions. I work with spinal reflexes. And I put people into positions which can develop flexibility without the feeling of stretching. I can help them to get strong while not feeling tense, get them to improve their blood flow and improve circulation without making their heart go faster. And so postures can do this individually. I also do it with movement as well. But what I think is important in terms of dealing with people who have trauma in their life, which I think of as a manifestation of an ongoing flight or fight response, is that I try and keep them away from the things which actually stimulate a flight or fight response, which to many people's surprise include things like stretching, tensing muscles, breathing more, and getting the heart rate to go up. Mm -hmm. See, in our modern perception of health, people tell you things like, you've got to get your heart rate up, you should breathe more, you shouldn't stretch and do you know, muscle exercises. But all those things the body perceives as stress. The body perceives it as part of your flight or fight response. So it's not that I'm saying don't get flexible. 
flexibility is very important for functional daily life, but can you get flexible without stretching? And the answer is yes, when you understand how to use posture the right way and movement and breathing as well. And similarly, it's not wrong to get strong. We want strength to be functionally strong, but if you're feeling tense while getting strong, this is what causes problems long-term emotionally as well. And similarly, when your heart rate goes up, that becomes an issue. The body starts to perceive it's about to fail soon. So what we want is improved uh, cardiovascular system, much better circulation, but without the heart racing, without the heart going faster. And so uh, a lot of people think that it's good to get your heart rate up, but actually what we want is to be like a fit person who runs fast, but their heart is hardly beating at all. You know, a person who runs fast, who hardly breathes at all. So we don't want to be a person who has their heart beating more and, and breathing more. We want to be a person who's like a fit person who runs fast, hardly breathes, hardly has their heart beats. And maybe like an Olympic athlete or gymnast who does all these amazing cartwheels, handsprings, backflips, lands in the splits. But to them, it doesn't feel like stretching. It just feels like a movement. You know, I always talk about, you know, when, when uh, people try and do stretching, they're often pulling themselves into positions that feel like a stretch. But I often say to people, if you cross your arms like this, does it feel like a stretch? And people go, not really. I mean, can you bend your elbow more to make it stretch the elbow? And the answer is no. But just imagine you bent your elbow. If you felt a stretch in the elbow, your next thought would be something must be wrong with my elbow. Similarly, if you bent your elbow and you go, gee, that's a strong biceps workout, you think something's wrong with my biceps. A healthy, natural body does not feel stretch or tension when they move. We want to be flexible and strong. We don't want to feel stretch or tension. And stretch is the step just before pain, which is the step just before injury. And similarly with tension. Tension, that feeling we're having in a muscle, is the step just before you have muscle failure and you know, pain or muscle failure. So can you make people stronger and more flexible without tension or stretch? The answer is yes, when you understand how to access your spinal reflexes, how to access the bridges between conscious and unconscious. So this is probably the most important thing about posture. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting, yeah, it's very counterintuitive, um, but I totally mm. get what you're saying. So that, that's mm. very interesting. Mm. So, okay. So what, so we've talked about posture as it relates to this topic. What about just movement in general? What, what are you recommending for people to how to move their bodies? What ways to move their bodies that would be helpful for someone who has, who's struggled with trauma? Okay. The, um, the, the movements that I get people to do initially are active movements. Active movements means that I'm not using gravity or momentum or one limb pulling another to move their body. I get them to use their own muscles to gently move their joints in a way which is pain-free through a range of motion which is not to the full extreme range, otherwise you reach your limits. And when you reach your limits of the range of motion, the body feels trapped. So you always want to feel like you can move to a certain point, but you always want to feel you can go a little bit further and not come like you're in a corner. You know, when people do um, something like jujitsu or any martial art, they know that if they get the elbow in the straightened position like this and you can't straighten the elbow more, that's an invitation to snap someone's elbow because the, the elbow has no more range. So by moving in a way where you're not moving to your extremes, but you're moving actively, you get freedom. And the active movement gives the possibility of when one muscle turns on to make a movement, the opposite muscle turns off and relaxes, which gets rid of a stretch reflex, which means then the muscle that you're uh, lengthening won't feel so stretchy. And also the muscle that you're activating, because it's a normal movement, will actually get stronger without feeling tense. And the combination of having a short active muscle and the opposite length and relaxed muscle means that blood flows because the short and tense muscle pushes blood away and the length and relaxed muscle pulls blood towards. So by moving actively in this way, you turn your body into a large heart, a large pump. And so blood flows without the heart racing. And so you get enhancement of circulation, which is really good for health, but with the dominance of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is really good for feeling opposite of flight or fight response. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about movement is it's all natural movement starts from the core of the body. 
And the core of the body is that region between the navel and the pubic bone, between the top of the hips and the tailbone. It's just inside of the L5S1 junction of the lower back, below the level of the top of the hips. And actually, this central point is well known in traditional cultures. Like in uh, China, they call it the Dantian. That's the most common Western uh, word that's crept in, word, word that's crept into the West, rather. In India, they call it the Kanda, K-A-N-D-A. In Japan, they call it the center of the Hara, the Tanden. In indigenous Australian cultures, they call it the Nadu Kuru. And in the modern West, we talk about it as that point around which there is centered the enteric nervous system, which is the third and largest part of your autonomic or automatic nervous system, because you have the sympathetic nervous system or flight or fight response everyone knows about mostly, the parasympathetic nervous system, that which is we call rest, rejuvenate, relax, regenerate. And then the third part, the largest part, which is not that well known, is called your enteric nervous system, which is a large plexus of nerves, which centers itself around this core region I was talking about, but it's wrapped around the intestines. And it's that people have heard of it because of the gut-brain interaction. But actually, that's also not just where a lot of the feelings that we have, thinking it's in our head, but coming from our gut, are coming from, but also that's where all movement should start from. So when you start leading people to move from their core and getting out of their head, the common, uh, very unhelpful paradigm of lock your core and engage your core and you know lock your abs and tighten your abs, this is unhelpful. You get them to move their core rather than lock their core, to breathe from their core, to breathe naturally into the abdomen rather than take breaths into their chest. They move away from flight or fight and they move towards a, a naturally sensed uh, perception of the environment because most of the time our environment is not one that requires flight or fight. So when they start moving from their core, they start to make a more natural sense. Do I need to be afraid? Do I need to be scared? No. But if they're locking their core, it automatically puts them back into fear and then trauma comes back again. So by moving from the core, by moving actively from the core, by breathing from your core, you start to get the body's natural regulatory uh, system, the enteric nervous system, working in a way which brings people back to the reality of their situation, which is not one to be fearful of. And I think this starts to help get rid of trauma a lot. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. Getting back to the reality of the situation, right? Because of obviously living in um, past trauma is so yes. damaging yes. to people and um, yeah, yeah, no, no healthy way to live um, ongoingly. Can no. be really painful. Um, yeah. So, okay. So great. We've, we got posture and, and movement and different ways of moving. Now let's talk about breath. You mentioned that, you know, we have this idea that we should be breathing more and all of that. What, what's your take on breath and breath work? Okay, uh, you know, I, I can teach very advanced breath work. And, you know, my idea of doing breath work for myself is really enjoyable for me, but it's way too difficult for almost everyone, except for a few of my very experienced students. In Indian yoga, which is probably the most common you know, system which people have talked about breathing in, it's considered that you're not even beginning the Indian pranayama yoga breathing system until you can begin, until you can breathe less than one full breath per minute. And real pranayama doesn't start till you can do less than one breath in five minutes. And if someone were to breathe more than one full breath in one minute, then that actually becomes hyperventilation. And hyperventilation is a manifestation of the fight or fight response hyperventilation where you're basically breathing more air than your body needs at the time will cause reduced blood flow to the brain especially to the frontal part of the brain and makes all the blood go to the reptilian sort of brain and also it causes less oxygen to travel from the lungs into the blood it also causes the nervous system to enter a much more sensitive state which can provoke more trauma or more emotion. And also it causes a reduction of the entry of oxygen from the oxygen carrying molecule, the oxyhemoglobin into the blood, which means then that the, it's sorry, into the body cells. So you, you get less transfer of oxygen from the red blood cells into your body cells, which means then you develop uh, only one nineteenth the amount of energy 
that you would otherwise get if you got oxygen into the cells, which means you have to eat more. You have to also feel more tired. You need more sleep. So what we want is for people to be in a very present moment state. I mean, the art of yoga, they always say, is to be here now and to be content with how you are in the present moment and feel connected to the people around you. So when someone feels connected in the present moment and they feel connected usually means joining. The idea of connection is a little bit like saying what happens with a mother and a child. The best connections are loving connections. It's really hard to connect if you're not in love. And the best way to connect is in love. So what I try and create for my clients, my students, uh, is to create a, a sharing, a generation, a circulation of good energy and loving information inside their body. And when I say that, it sounds a bit hippie. So when I say sharing good energy inside their body, I mean getting blood to flow without the heart racing. And when I say loving information, I mean the information that's carried in the parasympathetic nervous system. And so when they start to feel within their body, good energy and loving information being shared into every cell, the message is one of love, peace, trust, safety. And then that message is a message that's more easily expressed to the world around them. They start to trust the people they're with more easily if they trust themselves. They start to be feeling more safe in their environment. They trust the earth, etc. Um, this um, this idea is, um, is is really an important aspect in all exercise because. If your body does not feel connected like this and you get disharmony, it's a breeding ground for things like cancer and autoimmune disease. Because cancer is when all the cells in the body or many cells decide to hog all the information for themselves. Autoimmune disease is when some cells decide they're going to kill other cells. Whereas what we want for perfect health in body and mind is a, a union of 50 trillion cells inside our body who all have their individual consciousness, but somehow come together as a group consciousness. You know, I was a molecular biologist and we used to take human cells, put them in dishes. And the first thing you observe is that every cell in our body has a mind of its own. And so our perception to be one consciousness is actually just a perception. And what we have is a group consciousness, like a swarm of birds or a hive of bees, everyone working together as one. And so perfect health is where there is no dissociation, but only connection inside your body. And I'll call that connection the, the connection that comes by sharing good energy and loving information inside yourself and really give, give yourself that message through adequate posture, movement, breathing, mental control. And then it's a message that goes into the outside. Mm. That's, that's a, a start at least. Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, that was a very, yeah, I love how you described that. That's awesome. Um, so, okay. So let's talk about mental health. Um, I know again, that's part of what you do. So like um, in the title of your talk today, you said mental control. What, what does that mean and how can people start utilizing that to help them um, through the traumas that they've had? Okay, well, I give them exercises, which, you know, predominantly I can only control my clients while I'm with them. You know, if I, if I really had to help someone, I would like to be with them for 24 hours a day for quite a long time. And then you've got a chance of really impacting someone. But all I can usually do is give people a little bit of time to practice some simple exercises with me. And one of the things I get them to do while giving them the various types of posture, movement and breathing that I'm giving them is I get them to connect their conscious with their unconscious or their subconscious. And I do this through four different ways. One of them is by moving blood through the body. Another is by accessing the spinal reflexes. Another one is the way I teach them because part of what I'm teaching will be using words and other parts of what I'm teaching is purely visual instruction. And so, for example, word instruction goes for left brain, whereas visual instruction goes to right brain. And when you get a combination of left and right brain working together, that studies seem to show that people learn much better. They, they start to absorb new ideas, reprogram you know, unwanted programs more easily when you can access both sides of the brain. And so also to facilitate that, I make sure if I'm teaching them, I make sure that both eyes are getting the same input. 
Because if someone is talking to you like I'm talking to you now, I can see you predominantly with my right eye, but not with my left. Mm -hmm. So often people sit talking to people like this. So often watching a lecture, the lecturer is not in front of them, but more to the right or the left. And right now then, because my right eye is seeing you, my left brain is getting all the input. Whereas if I look like this, my left eye gets the input, which means my right brain is being more stimulated. So what we want, I think, for learning is to make sure both eyes get equal input and I incorporate that into my teaching. But then the most, possibly the most effective way of using mental control to access subconscious or unconscious uh, things is to use what are sometimes called the bridges between conscious and unconscious. There are 12 places in the body which when you access them, you're possibly accessing subconscious and conscious at the same time. One of these is the diaphragm. And often people say to you, breathing is the link between body and mind, or breathing is the link between conscious and unconscious. It's not actually the breathing. It's the diaphragm, or more specifically, the phrenic nerve, because the diaphragm is something which we can control consciously. So I can say to you, you let's know, breathe into the abdomen. So you inhale into your abdomen, and it means your diaphragm is moving downwards to bring air into your chest. But, you're doing exactly that in the most deepest part of your sleep. So people can control the diaphragm both consciously and unconsciously. Whereas something like your elbow, you can only control consciously. Or muscles like those in your blood vessels can only be controlled unconsciously, mostly. Mm -hmm. But there are 12 places in the body, one of which is the diaphragm, which you can control both consciously and unconsciously. The other places include things like the eyes, blinking. So if you blink, you can do that consciously, but if something suddenly goes in front of your face, you blink automatically. Same also with your inner eye muscles. Like I can roll my eyes up or down, I can set them right up, so maybe you only see the whites of my eyes. But that's what happens to someone in their deepest sleep. Similarly, the pelvic floor, front, back, and middle, has dual control. So does the lips, the jaw, the swallowing apparatus, our ability to make saliva, and surprisingly, the fingers and toes and the neck. So I get them to control these 12 bridges during their practice. And by accessing and mentally thinking about, can my fingers move? Can my shoulders roll? Can my neck move? Can I move my jaw? Can I move my lips? Can I blink? Can I activate my perineum or release my perineum? And these things, the mental control required to access those points, starts to reset their nervous system and help them be more present and sense there's actually no threat. There is no danger. I don't need to live in the past. I don't need to be fearful. I can be here now. Mm. And so it's these sort of things that I can also share in my thing later on as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. That's awesome. I really appreciate you going through all those um, different, you know, modalities that you, you know, teach people as far as, as it relates to people struggling with trauma. So um, I love it if I want to talk a little bit more about that, but I'd, I'd love it if you first share about some free resources you have for people as well as a course that they might be interested in. And everyone watching, there's a couple buttons below that you can click on to head over to Simon's site. Cause, so could you share about those two first? Okay. Well, I'm giving you I'm, I'm giving anyone who wants uh, a package of four videos. They're not too long and uh, a, a PDF file. And in the PDF file, I describe a little bit about how to use the videos. And I also give you links to some of the other courses that we've got as well. And also links to a whole series of uh, YouTube um, programs, interviews and talks that I've done that will help, you know, build up, the understanding of what I'm saying. But the four videos, one of them is a simple set of joint movements, which can be really done very accessibly. They're safe, accessible, but very effective movements of your joints that I teach to happen and start from the core. And it's a simple 10 minute practice, which is done visually. And I've got a 15 or 20 minute practice of simple spinal movements. So the spine or the trunk is a large, amplification of your core. So when you move your trunk and get out of the paradigm of lock the core and the paradigm of neutral spine only, and you start to move your trunk, it gives tremendous benefits for the health of your spine, release a lot of lower back pain and discomfort, and also helps energy levels and also helps your mind because it makes you feel good. I talk about it as being like a way of feeling like you're in a warm bath being massaged by someone who really loves you. And so this is a simple practice like that. And then I also give um, another simple spinal movements, which relates a little bit more to modern yoga, 
with simple postures that you can do. And another longer sequence, which is for more advanced people, which looks like a modern yoga practice in the postures, but the way I move between the poses changes them completely. So you can much more easily get flexible and strong without feeling tense or flexible. So it's four little you know, things like that. And so that everyone at different levels can choose what they want out of it. Mm, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I think it'll help people to write, start being able, being able to actually practice this in their own bodies after having, you know, listened to you talk about, you know, how this can be helpful for them. So I love that. Um, so also, what about your, the course that you have that people might be interested in? Well, we have several courses, but the one that I think would, people would find most interesting is one which we call the therapeutic applications of posture, movement, breathing, and mental control. And within that, I go through a whole series of musculoskeletal uh, complaints, you know, simple things like lower back pain, neck pain, hip, knee, ankle problems, wrist, elbow, shoulder problems, but then also physiological complaints in the body, including those which reflect lack of energy or nervous system problems, and even, you know, digestive dysfunction, immune system dysfunction. But then along with all of that, there is the possibility of once your body starts to feel good and once you can work in a way, because there's exercises all the way through it, where you can start to feel happy to be in your body while the body feels good, you start to enter a meditative state. And the meditative state is not something which many people think of a meditative state as just sitting still, being you know, bored in an uncomfortable position where you get cold. But for me, when I looked at the real studies on meditation, it's a place which you can do in any activity, provided the activity has five main features. One is that it's got to be sustainable. You have to be able to do it for a long time. You know, a couple of hours ideally. It also has to be engaging. In other words, not too stressful, not too boring. It also has to be giving a calming effect. It wants to make you feel calm without the heart racing or feeling stretch or tension, you know this. It also wants to feel effortless, no pain in it, no, no struggle in it. And it must move the blood inside you. It must be invigorating. And when you can get these five features of what I'll call the meditative state, which some athletes call being in the zone or being in the flow state, then the mind automatically enters a place of being here and now. And because the body starts to feel like you're in a warm bath being massaged by someone who really loves you, it starts to really make you forget traumas of the past and start to relish the pleasantness of the present. And so this course, then you know, called the Therapeutic Applications of Posture, Movement and Breathing, addresses these issues. And uh, I think it's a very effective course. It's about a I think 36 hours and 90 short videos and, and a, a set of notes to go with it. And I find it very effective for most people. Beautiful. Thank you so much for, for offering that for everybody as well as the, the free resources. And again, everyone, those buttons are below so you can click through to Simon's site. Um, here's a question. Um, you've mentioned things throughout this interview around right connecting to other people. And I know that so many people who have struggled with PTSD or, or continue, continue to struggle with it have a hard time trusting. And you kind of, you mentioned that in there too, I guess any more insights that you could share on how, um, you know, the breathing, the posture, the movements, the mental control could help people in their relationships. I think the most important way of doing it in a way that a therapist can help a client when they're only seeing them for a short time is getting the, uh, paradigms out of their head which are very dominant in our society such as get rid of the idea of no pain no gain get rid of the idea of survival of the fittest and get rid of this often monotheistic religious idea that you know if you're not working hard and suffering you're not going to go to heaven these things dominate exercise and our life and if you can get people to appreciate that it's possible to do something which actually feels enjoyable physically, physiologically, and mentally while you are doing it, not for some end goal after, but while you're actually doing it, it can still give you benefits on a physical, physical physiological, and mental level. That's an important thing to give them. But then to give them that concept is important. 
but to actually show it to them is also important so mm -hmm. they've got to experience it. But often I find, unless I explain the rationale behind what I'm offering as a, as a system of posture movement and breathing, people are stuck in that paradigm. And no matter how much I say, be gentle, be gentle, be loving within yourself, they're still in that headset of like, this is not going to work unless I suffer. This is not going to work unless there's a bit of pain. So you really have to explain why these are outmoded concepts. And sometimes a bit of science helps. Like, for example, it's been well understood now that the best results will come for, say, an Olympic runner. If when they are running for, say, 100 minutes, the Olympic trainer will know that you only let that runner run to the level where they can't talk for maybe five or 10 minutes. The other 80 to 95 minutes, they should be able to talk normally while they're exercising. That's mm -hmm. not the way most people exercise mm -hmm. in the West. You know, they're, they're doing nothing most of the week. Then three or four times a week, they struggle for 45 minutes, exhaust themselves. They're not enjoying it often while they're doing it, but they're feeling good afterwards for having done it, which is like a punishment reward system. You know, it's mm -hmm. not the best way of working. So I think it's really important to get these two basic concepts. But what you want is to practice in a way where you can trust that what you're doing is going to feel good. And once you start making trusting, loving connections within your body, where you start to feel blood flow without the heart racing, and you start getting, you start getting results that your body's more flexible, more mobile, more strong, but you didn't feel stressed, you didn't feel tension, then you start to trust your own self. It makes it so much easier to trust the people around you. Mm, beautiful. Mm, you know? Thank you. I love that. I appreciate you talking about that. I know so many people um, struggle in relationships as a result of, of past traumas and um, stuff that happened yes. in their childhood. So very important. Um, any last insights, Simon? Anything else you feel like we've left out of this conversation? Anything else you want to leave people with before we wrap up? Oh, there are so many things. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know where to start. I think it's just really important to, to reaffirm that message that what we want to do to get rid of past traumas is to be here now and to start living in the present moment and to practice in a way which is practice the things that we do in a way that's going to invite us to come back. As a therapist, you know, I can have someone come to me with a knee problem. And when they come to me with a knee problem, I'm very good at helping knees. I've broken both my knees and damaged them in many ways, but I've fixed them. So I can, I'm confident. Someone comes with a knee problem. I do this and that. I say, bend here, do this exercise here. And they go, oh, my knee's fixed. And I go, it's not fixed. It's temporarily better, but you need to do those exercises three times a day for a month. They go, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Then I see them a month later. I say, how's your knee? Oh, it still hurts. Did you do your exercises? <laughs> no, I didn't have time. I didn't. The thing is, it's not, not so much people don't do exercises through lack of time. They're just not enjoyable. Mm -hmm. If you want someone to exercise, to do something which is going to be good for them, it must be good for them while they're doing it. It's got to be enjoyable. So I really urge people to, if they can't you know, adapt something I'm offering, Find a practice which involves using your body, which is fun to do. Something which you can become passionate about. You see, to enter the possibility of ridding past trauma, you have to stay conscious. And if people are conscious, there is no trauma in the past. Conscious is here and now. And they find that the best way to bring people into a conscious state is when you're in love. And often people relate to the idea that when they first have a new boyfriend or girlfriend, that, that suddenly they care about how they look or they care about how their house looks and make everything a bit tidy. You're more conscious when you're in love, but you don't need a partner to be in love. You just need to have a hobby or a passion. It's about being passionate about what you do. So I recommend that people find something they can do that they're passionate about, ideally something which engages their body, where they can enjoy doing it and be here now while doing it. And when they're here and now, they move away already from past trauma. But the other thing, of course, is that these are general things. If I really have to treat someone with past trauma, I, I want to talk to them. I can give general things like today, but really to liaise with someone and meet them on a personal level. There's so many specific things that you could do for each individual. And that's what my, my passion is mostly. I'd rather meet individuals. Mm -hmm. But it's also really useful to have some general things to do for crowds. Yeah. So if I could finish by saying perhaps that 
what we want is three things to achieve the possibility of getting rid of the depression of the past or the anxiety of the future or the trauma that links past and future then what we need to do is be engaged in the here and now in a conscious passionate loving way and so what we want really is to feel like we are circulating good energy and loving information first within ourselves as a model to spread out to the people around us and the world around us so have that is the first step the purpose the desire to spread good energy and loving information inside yourself then to the world outside and then the second thing is what stops good energy and loving information inside the body flowing naturally because it should flow naturally and the things that stop it are five things too much tension too much stretching or inappropriate posture like sitting on chairs to long run position too much breathing especially if it's forced over breathing into the chest too much thinking in other words too much rattling the brain was really engaging in one activity is a more one focused activity and too much eating so i recommend tense less stretch less breathe less think less eat less they're the things that stop good energy and loving information flowing. And then the third thing is make the energy and loving information move through your body. And to do that, move actively into the positions you're doing. Avoid being pulling yourself in or falling into a hamstring stretch by bending forward with gravity. Lift your body into the positions. Use your own muscles. Then move from the core. Don't lock the core. Breathe naturally and move fluidly. So in your practice, make it graceful. And you'll see the, the gift practices I've given. It's a smooth, fluid dance. Very easy, not complicated choreography, just eight simple movements and a couple of combinations of them. So you move actively, move from the core, breathe naturally, move fluidly. And I've summarized that in the notes that I've given as well. And when you do that, then you start to enter this place of generating and circulating good energy loving information in your body and you start to feel like you're here and now in a warm bath being massaged mm -hmm. by someone who really loves you and at the end of the practice you're stronger fitter more flexible happier healthier on the inside with more energy mm, awesome thank you simon i love it <laughs> thank you I, I appreciate you being here and and walking us through this today and i appreciate all the work you do in the world thanks so much Andy, it's such a privilege and a pleasure to be here on your thing that you're doing. I think what you're doing is amazing. And I really look forward to seeing all the other talks that you're doing. And I recommend them to everyone else. Yeah. Bless you. And thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll see you again real soon. Take care.